Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash using your power. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Today, we'd like to suggest 1984 by George Orwell, a book written in 1949 to show readers what life could be like with government control. <laughs> Welcome to Using Your Power. I'm David Andrew Weave, and joining me is... Levin Cora. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Powered up. I am excited about today's topic. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to be the devil's advocate for today and ask more questions than, than trying to provide some kind of answer, but I think it is going to be a really great, interesting conversation, very charged conversation. Absolutely. You know, one of the things, I, I guess, before we get into this, just uh, let's kind of just wanted to ask you what you've been up to and uh, what, what's kind of some of the stuff you've been working on for uh, your business. Yeah, well, I actually have multiple shows coming up, so I guess that's not directly related to business, but I am, you know, preparing for a few performances that I have coming up in in February, of which there are probably about four or five, which is which is a good number. I am I'm continuing to release new content for my blog, obviously, creating podcast episodes, working with a contractor on on new content as well, and looking to get her stuff published and people are talking to me about guest posts so there's guest posts that i need to publish to the site as well doing some interviews like i did one recently with sean harley tucker who's a fellow podcaster in well not in calgary but in okotoks which is fairly close yeah right right down the street kind yeah of deal and then I'm also talking with others who are launching a new project in the music industry. It sort of sounds like the Quora of the music industry, where musicians can go and ask specific questions and get specific answers tailored to them. So I'm also going to be writing a piece and releasing a piece about them. So there's really a lot on the go. Right. And that's Q-U-O-R-A? Yeah, it's Quora. Q-U-O-R-A dot right. com. Not Quora, as in my last name. Yeah, it's a little different from your last name. It's a little, little bit different did, website. Did you invent the website there, man? I was actually looking at it. I thought I'd came upon it. I was like, uh, is this my website? Who stole my name? <laughs> um, but no, uh, you know, that's excellent stuff. And you know, by the time this episode does air, you know, you'll have a lot of those uh, things completed. You'll have all your shows in the books. Uh, you'll mm-hmm. have definitely reached out and uh, talked to a lot of different people. You know, same thing on my end. You know, I'm just working on blogs for, for Discover Your Life today. And, uh, you know, just looking on kind of what next steps I need to do, obviously still working with you and finding out, you know, what kind of tweaks we need to make to the website to continue to, you know, get uh, subscriptions up and, you know, just get the readership up on the website. You know, that's part one of the plan. And uh, so continue to work on that. And that's uh, that's where I am, too. Yeah. At this point, we're beginning to do more outreach, putting press releases together exploring guest posting opportunities. Really, a lot of the things that used to work maybe in like 2011 or even prior to 2011 with Google and backlinking and article marketing and article spinning and that kind of stuff doesn't really work anymore. So what are the legit ways? What are the best ways for us to get out there now, you know, beyond just kind of the word of mouth that we can do, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or in person, although word of mouth is powerful and it does seem everybody that I talk to is at least interested in this concept of the podcast that we're doing. So I think it is sending a few people over that way as well. But yeah, I think we're spending time thinking about what are the strategies that work today and are relevant today versus the things that used to work for online business. Right on. And you know, um, I think that's a great episode to do, um, uh, for our next episode here. So I think uh, yeah. we could definitely call it uh, how to increase traffic to your website, blog, or podcast. That sounds great. Uh, yeah, I'm excited for that topic. Awesome. So what are we talking about today then, David? Well, I think we're going to take a look at the corrupt banking system. I, I'm not think, I think, I think I know we are going to take a look at it. <laughs> uh, no, we are going to look at it, you know, and it's an interesting... Um, I guess there's a lot of things that are happening, right? I mean, uh, today we're, we're talking is in January, February here. You know, by the time this podcast airs, it'll be sometime into April. Uh, you know, what some of the stuff that we talk about may come into fruition. A lot of things that we talk about, um, you know, the news is going to just uh, hopefully be able to pro- project a lot of what we're saying. A lot of the uh, the underground media as well, I'm hoping, is, is able to also bring a lot of what we talk about uh, into fruition as well. So there's a lot of things that we'll be going over today. I, 
I do have a, a feeling this is going to be a supercharged topic. I'm like, I already yeah. kind of feel my heart rate <laughs> starting to right. race, uh, race here. So, uh, but you know, uh, I did, uh, come across an article here that was actually passed to me by a friend of mine. Um, was actually on the website called the uh, the event chronicle.com and this article was written by a gentleman by the name of Michael uh, Rivero and uh, the article is called all wars are engineered by the banksters and after reading that article it would really kind of had me thinking and really you know had me wondering you know what kind of world do we actually live in and and why are we living in the world we live in and you know why do we kind of work a nine to five you know why do we have certain things why do we have debt and all these things so these are kind of the, the things and thoughts that were coming to me so I really wanted to bring this to you and say hey you know what let's talk about this let's get two different sides of the story and you know uh, if it's a question and answer thing or you know I'd love to get some of your mm-hmm. input in here as well uh, and, and really just try to look at both sides of the story because again I've worked at the ba- I've worked in banks for uh, over six years you know so I've worked in insurance and stuff where you know a lot of the two biggest uh, money makers in the world are banks you know quarter after quarter as well as insurance companies right so mm. uh, it's a great perspective to also come from I've done some research and poking around as well and so just in case anybody listening thinks we're just kind of pulling this stuff out of our butt I mean there are so <laughs> many sources to review when it comes to this whole idea of the banking system being corrupt there are documentaries, there are articles, there are blog posts, and stuff that's even been published by the likes of NPR and PBS to do with this subject matter. So that should just go to tell you that, that we're not just pulling this out of thin air because it sounds like a cool topic. It's depending on the perspective you're getting there, you know, you might hear different things about how the banking system works or doesn't work. It all depends on the the exact source that you go to to find out that information. But reality is a lot of people have published things about the corrupt system the corrupt system no, for sure, right? And I think that's what we want to bring to people's attention too, right? I mean, uh, unfortunately, most of us, if not all of us, you know, no matter if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a nine to five person or, or not, it doesn't really matter what your position is. You know, CEO of a big corporation or just an employee, you know, as a janitor, for example, doesn't matter where you are on that ladder, you are still going to be affected by the banking system in your country. You know, if it's Canada, if it's in US, you know, that's our two biggest markets. We're nor- living in North America, right? We live in Canada. Yeah. So, uh, but even if you're in Europe, I mean, with all this Brexit stuff happening overseas in in, uh, in Britain and all the stuff happening in Europe with the euro and in Greece with the they can't make their pay payouts and stuff. There's a reason all this stuff is happening, right? All the the countries and you know in Africa as well on the continent of Africa, uh, all the problems that you see in South Africa and in Asia and in um, you know all these poorer countries as well, uh, all across the world. You know, there's a reason all this is happening. And if you start digging in deep, uh, mm. kind of what we're hoping to start doing is just start kind of just start digging with that first initial dirt in the sh- with a shovel here and really start you know st- slowly getting into uh, some of the deeper stuff right I know this is going to be probably one of our most charged uh, topics and a little bit more mm. um, you know more in-depth topics it's not going to be something that's similar to what we're usually you know talking about leadership and and uh, you know podcasting and stuff like that so you said you read that article I'm just wondering what you took away from it what did you learn well, you know, there were so many points on that article that I took, but one of the biggest things I took uh, from that article was, you know, who controls our money, right? And when I say our money is, is the global money, right? So there's, you know, there's a couple of families that um, do uh, control that money, right? And that one of them being the Rothschild family, the Rockefeller family, mm-hmm. and the Morgan family, right? I mean, a lot of people may not know who the Morgan family is potentially, and maybe don't know who the Rothschild family is, but everybody's heard about Rockefeller Square uh, in New York, right? I mean, it's it's a definitely a, an important landscape icon in New York, and you know that name is is to that family, right, for a reason. And uh, when you go to New York, you kind of hear about these names of Rockefeller, and and uh, you know, and and it's very synonymous with oil as well, if I remember, uh, with uh, J D Rockefeller. Mm. Uh, he's uh, I believe was an oil guy as well. So when you start putting these things together, but you know, when I started doing my own research about the Rothschild family, there was just an article actually uh, in late January that was um, published saying that, you know, the Rothschild family had more money uh, combined than the top eight billionaires in the world. And that's putting people like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Mm. uh, Carlos... Uh, Slim, I believe that's his name, the the Mexican uh, gentleman who's a billionaire as well. You start taking the, and Michael Bloomberg was on that list. Uh, you start taking the top eight billionaires and this fam- one family had more money than all eight of them combined for well over $500 billion. So is it fair to say like these three families that you mentioned 
kind of have a corner on the world's wealth in a way. Well, absolutely, I would say. You know, if you if you uh, you know everybody has a bank account for the most part, right? I mean, there's probably a few people who choose not to have bank accounts, and this may be part of the reasons they choose not to have a bank account. Mm. Uh, you know, maybe they unfortunately make their money illegally, and they can't have a bank account either, right? So, I mean, there's reasons people don't. But for the people that do have a bank account, yeah, for sure. You know, uh, you have to the banks in in the U.S. especially have to borrow money from the Federal Reserve, uh, and then the Federal Reserve will tax or you have to pay an interest on that money back to them. So it was kind of an interesting thing. And yeah, I'm, we've all heard of this. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen this movie a few years ago, um, David. It's called Zeitgeist. No, I haven't. No, it was a pretty interesting movie. So that's kind of what they were doing. So first part of the movie, uh, they were talking about... Um, religion and, and how many of the religions in the world are very similar. And then they started talking mm. about, um, you know, the banking system. And then they're also talking about how the banking system caused 9-11, right? So I know a lot of, there's a lot of stories and you can go on news and you can look at the alternative news. You can go on any online syndication and they're talking about, uh, you know, was 9-11 a hoax? You know, some people say it was a terrorist that did it from all these, um, you know, Saudi countries or uh, Muslim countries. And then some people say, no, no, it was the American government who, who did this to their own people by hiring out these these uh, Muslim people to carry out the attacks, right? I mean, there's so many different things. And they'll, they'll, they showed on the video, too, like how, you know, all this stuff, how religion and uh, money and the banking system is all is controlling uh, the way wars and uh, oil and all the things that we fight for. So just because these three families own a good chunk of the wealth doesn't necessarily mean that they're corrupt, though, right? Because even in the music industry, there are three major labels and they own a good chunk of the music industry, if not, you know, good 80 percent of it. So how does that how does that stack up in terms of the banking system? Well, I mean, if you're going to look at what's corrupt, what's not corrupt, I, do, I think it does come to a definition. I think the definition of corrupt usually means, you know, that the person is doing something completely illegal. These guys have figured out a way to do something that's legal. And I mean, the way they they charge interest on money is very legal. But how is it that they can charge interest on money that's not real? So like such as credit cards, how can you tell me that this is not a corrupt system when you can charge money on money that doesn't exist. So just to give an example, you get a credit card with $5,000 limit. Well, that money is not real. It's just a, it's a limit. It's a credit limit in hopes that, you know, if you go to the store, you make a payment on something in within 30 days, you'll make a payment for whatever you purchase with real cash that you have in the bank account. Now, if you do not make that payment or you just make a partial payment, hey, no problem. They're happy with it. But they say, we're going to charge you in most credit cards somewhere between 18 to 20 percent, something like that. Right. But that's fine. So they charge you that. That's your agreement you have. But let's say the next month you still don't make it. Now they charge you on the initial principal amount that you borrowed. Then they charge you on the initial uh, interest that they had charged you as well. So now they're making money on compound interest as well. So, you know, there's something is said about that so that's how they you know they they print money and they they sell it to you know that money to the united states and then the united states has to pay an interest on that too well how do you how much money do you think uh an interest of even one or two percent on trillions of dollars becomes and how do you have to pay for that eventually right so um that system is not necessarily corrupt but i would say i would really question the practice of that system I was even watching a video today that essentially said the only way to inject the economy with additional funds is to offer loans. Without creating those loans, there's no additional funds created in the economy. I don't know if that's true or not, but it sounds pretty fishy to me. Well, I think you also said by having to borrow, if one person makes money, someone has to borrow money, right? yeah. something along that line. Someone has they to were, go into debt, right? Yes. They were basically saying that for you to have a certain amount of money, let's say $2,000, somebody would have to be in debt $2,000. So there's that weird equilibrium between you having and someone else not having. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they were saying. Well, it kind of makes sense, right? If you start looking at um, 
you know, control is about who has the most, right? I don't care yeah. what it is. And if it's about music, you know, whoever has the most number one singles in music, that's usually who controls the billboard charts. The person who has the most money, uh, you know, amount of products and who, who sells the most amount of products in a business usually controls that product uh, business as well, right? Look at people like Bill Gates. Microsoft owned, you know, a corner of that market for years and years and years. And that's what definitely helped him uh, become the world's number one billionaire for years on years, right? And if you look at someone like uh, Warren Buffett, for example, he had an opportunity to take the strategies and implement those. And he did it good. He did it very smart. And, you know, and he continued to do what worked for him. And he controls a huge portion of that, right? And he started businesses that can then also control uh, assets as well, right? So um, the, you look, then you start looking at the people who are not, right? The have nots. And if you look in society, that's usually what the big talk about is. It's about the have and the have nots. And the have nots are becoming more of the population in the world versus the haves. Also, in terms of the record industry, I might have painted a picture that they were completely innocent. That's <laughs> that's far from the reality. And I have colleagues that believe actually the music industry is is corrupt, and the three major labels are have a tight hold on on everything on a lot of the assets within within the industry. And artist exploitation is kind of a real documented fact. Even the Backstreet Boys kind of commented on the fact that they were exploited early on in their careers, and they weren't seeing these thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars that they were supposed to be seeing from all this touring that they were doing year after year after year. So they didn't really see even a whole lot of money until much later. And that could also be to a point of exploitation and contracts, contracts that lock people into deals that aren't favorable to them and don't help them. Even somebody like Imogen Heap says she makes 80, 18% off of everything she ever earns in the music industry. That's somebody with a big label contract that has probably more control over music than a lot of artists do. And yet she only ever sees 18% of it from the total amount that she's making. Wow. You know, and it, it kind of um, brings me kind of to the same relevant point that we've been talking about, right? You said there's three companies that kind of, you know, run all of it, right? And if yeah. you look at it, same as the the public, the banks here, right? They're all privately held banks. They're not usually publicly held banks. Like the, the Federal Reserve, uh, or at least what's owned by the Rothschild family, you cannot buy stocks into the, the what they own what they own, right? Typically, most businesses you can buy stocks into. Like you can't, an IPO. Yeah, you cannot invest your hard-earned dollar to make money off this family. This family controls all of it. So if you even Wikipedia, uh, you know, Rothschild family and look up how many banks they own, you will see they literally own every single bank in almost every single country. I think there's maybe a total of between eight and three to eight banks that uh, they do not own in this whole world. So then you start looking at, well, how can one family hold so many banks, you know, mm. in, in their back pocket? How is it possible that they can make so much money off of all the people from all the different countries all over the world, right? It's not just happening in Canada and the United States, right? Let's not be um, blind to the fact it's happening all over the world. Something you mentioned interest a little bit earlier. That's something I wanted to drill into a little bit further because interest rates i mean when people think of that yes they might think of loans or they might think of their bank accounts but probably the number one thing people are concerned about and thinking about is consumer debt and how much interest rate is attached to credit cards and we know that sometimes you could have an annual rate of what like 12 percent or something crazy like that depending on depending on the terms of the credit card and there's all sorts of crazy clauses like i've I've heard of this. I cannot verify, but like people sitting down and writing these crazy clauses that made them millions and millions and millions of dollars just because they're in there, whether it's, you know, a 1% fee that seemingly looks innocent, but actually gouges you over the long haul. Well, it's so true. And, and you know, more commercials you see on TV, um, Nowadays, also, you know, there's a couple of them that I saw where where the there's a couple sitting down and they're meeting with their financial banker and they're looking at it and you know the financial banker guy's like, you know, don't worry about it. The stock market's a long term game. Don't worry about it. it's a long term game. They're like, well, my money's not a game, you know, and, and that's kind of the way mm. that the financial institutes see your money as a game, right? And the other one was, you know, how is it uh, that you guys are making more money off of my investment and you guys don't even have to invest a dollar? You know, they actually take fees out of your investment 
because they have to pay something. There's a there's a, a fee you pay maybe to pay the the manager of the fund or just because they created the fund. I'm not quite sure exactly why that fee is in place. You know, I've been told that it's to pay the manager of the fund, but I have a feeling that fee is for something a lot different than that, right? I just think they can charge you that, uh, you know, whatever it is, right? It's the same thing as if you're on the stock market and trading. Every time you make a stock trade, they charge you a small percentage of a fee to make a trade as well, right? So whoever is allowing you to do that, you know, they're taking a small percentage every single time. And coming down to credit cards, you know, you're right. Any, I mean, if you look at a mortgage, for example, uh, before I get to credit cards, you know, mortgages typically, you know, mm. that two, three, four percent range, right? These but days. In, these days, right? Right now. And I mean, if that interest rate goes up, you know, many people you're going to see are going to start having trouble again with their mortgage payments, right? And you look at something like that, but typically it makes sense to have a smaller percentage on a mortgage rate because even on a, for example, $500,000 loan at 2%, your interest is still just about $1,000 a month, give or take. Um, now, if you start looking at, for example, a car, you know, not that expensive, maybe a thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar car. You might have a, you know, a, a, an interest uh, loan from the bank. It'll probably be about six percent, give or take, right? If you can get it through the dealer financing, it's a lot better for sure, right? Sometimes zero, sometimes 0.99 percent. Hell of a lot better if you don't have that kind of money, you know, sixty four, sixty thousand dollars sitting in your bank account to pay for a car, right? Then you start looking at. Um, Simple, smaller numbers, like you start looking at credit cards, right? 5000 10000 $20,000 limits, right? And again, I think one of the things we were talking about um, when we did our buying a home episode was mm-hmm. you talked about, David, um, you know, the bank's come up with this number of how much how much um, money you're worth to them in a in a way of you know how much money can you pay back if something ever happened to you right exactly so the banks will look at that number and say okay you know we said we figure out that you could probably comfortably pay back you know let's say five hundred dollars a month no problem or ten thousand dollars a month no problem so we'll give you a credit limit that allows you to, you know, max yourself at a place where if you were having to borrow that money, you know, it would be easy for you to do so. And then, you know, you can pay to pay it back over time, but we're just going to charge you a small interest. The small interest is not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is they charge you on money that never existed and then they compound that money as well. Hmm. Another interesting thing about that is in some financial management or financial, I guess, accounting or investing practices, they they will take your money and invest it in a mutual fund or whatever, you know, based on what they feel is best for you and what you feel is best for you as well. And a lot of those fees apparently add up to more than people even realize. For example, they might see like a 3% fee and that may not actually be a a monthly fee, but an annual fee. So, or sorry, the other way around, not an annual fee, but a monthly fee. So you, you, you know, multiply three by 12 and when you get, you get 36%. Wow. 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 It's insane. Well, you know, it's funny. And if you actually look at a way a mortgage payment works, right? So although it may say on paper, your mortgage payment is, let's say 2.5% or whatnot. When you actually take your interest that you pay, um, let's say you make one month payment, right? And let's say in that one month payment, you you put down $2,000 towards your mortgage. And at 2% on a $500,000 mortgage, your interest rate is almost about $1,000, give or take. So that means out of your $2,000 payment, your interest rate was actually 50%. It wasn't 2%. Right. So it's an interesting thing. So you actually paid a 50% interest rate uh, payment to them. And then the remainder 50% went towards your principal. So it's an interesting way. We've been kind of sold, hey, no, no worries. Get this $600,000 mortgage or $400,000 mortgage or $300,000 mortgage, depending on your area, depending on the size of your home, depending on whatnot. And then, hey, don't worry, borrow it and just pay a small percentage. But that small percentage on a, a large amount is a lot of, a lot of money. The thing that came to mind as you're talking there was the word pyramid scheme or the term pyramid scheme. What are your thoughts on that, Mav? Is the financial system essentially a money machine? Well, it's and that's a very good question, David. I think one of the things you have to look at is what is funding the financial system, right? You know, why are we continually borrowing money, not just we as the people, but also our government, right? Big time. I think our government would be, if, if you look at any country, the government is typically at the top of this pyramid, uh, you know, and everybody else kind of falls somewhere below government, right? And on top of that government, in my personal opinion, is some of these rich families like the Rothschild families, the Rockefeller families, and the Morgan family, right? And if I think the Morgan family is actually uh, J.P. Morgan, 
uh, if I remember correctly, or the Morgan Stanley. I'm like one of those, for some reason, kind of uh, stick out to me. I'm not 100% sure. Definitely go out and do some research and look up those names and see how they how they connect, right? Um, but if you start looking at the the, the, you know, the people that are on top of this uh, pyramid, which is, let's say, the government, the government has to borrow money, right? So the bor- they borrow money from this institution that's separate from government, separate outside of the government rules as well, right? I mean, there's been uh, people, you know, people in history that have tried to get away from this interest uh, pay loans, right? And every time uh, we they've tried, especially in the US, they've been assassinated, right? So look at someone like John F. Kennedy, for example. He wanted to um, free people of the interest loan payments. What happened to him? He, he died. You look at someone like uh, McKinley, President McKinley for the United States. He also, uh, I believe, was assassinated or poisoned, same as Andrew Jackson. You know, these are some of the founding fathers of the United States who wanted to bring the United States to a place of having po- real power and the people having real power. But the people you know, that wanted to, in my opinion, control the world, right? And uh, I'm going to leave a statement towards the end of this podcast that I hopefully um, kind of brings together why I think this is all happening. Um, but, you know, these people uh, wanted to control, right? So even uh, in the article that uh, Michael Rivero uh, put out, you know, he, one of the statements in there is by uh, the Rothschild family, um, you know, the mother says, if my sons want a war, we will have a war, hmm. you know, and to me, that's phenomenal. Now, just for our listeners that may not be aware or may not know what a pyramid scheme is, it has three defining characteristics. One is that there's no product in, in a legitimate business. There's always some kind of exchange of service or product for a dollar amount in a pyramid scheme. There's no product involved, no service. The second characteristic is that it's legal, so you can't really do it. And then the third characteristic is the money all flows to the top. So when you begin to think about the fact that you're just talking about money and then you're going to add some money by creating a loan and then charge interest on a loan on money that doesn't exist, it starts to sound a lot like that definition. I mean, I'll let I'll let that you know sit with you and you can figure out for yourself whether that definition applies, but Right. Even like Ponzi schemes, I think are very similar, right? It's like it's taking money idea. that doesn't exist and, you know, trying to uh, uh, rob Peter to pay Paul. I think that's a lot of the reasons if you look at why the stock market crashed in 2007, right? Um, the housing market, the, the oil crash as well. I mean, it, more with the housing market for sure. People, the banks were loaning out more money uh, than the houses were valued at, right? In, in a, a way no. to, you know, just increase the um, you know, uh, housing market and increase the economy. But really what they were doing was, was putting people into further debt by giving out more money than people could afford to pay. So when the, the market did crash, well, guess what? Your house is worth a lot less. Maybe your $200,000 house is worth 150000 but guess what your loan was at? 200. So guess what you still have to pay? You have to pay $200,000 on a home that's only worth 150000 Well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you pay more for something that's valued a lot less. And that's one of the things. I think when you explain the way a pyramid scheme works, that's kind of it, right? It's making you pay more money for something that's worth not as much. Mm. And the global meltdown, I'm sure, is something that is somewhat fresh in people's minds. I mean, it was really only 2008, so we can assume anybody listening to this is probably 18 and up, although we try to be family-friendly when we can, certainly. Yeah, you know, I've been doing pretty good. I haven't swore yet. So. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? This could be could be a heated discussion. But exactly, it was the subprime lending. And, you know, there are even people saying they there was more they could have done to stop that from happening, but decided not to get involved or did very little to change it. You can even watch the movie The Big Short, which may not be ac- completely 100% accurate to true life, but still kind of documents the events of, of what happened and how some people got extremely wealthy off of that global meltdown. Well, and, well, you know, even if it wasn't 100% factual, I mean, even if it's 90% factual, that home, that movie does give you a real good idea of why this happened and, and why it was allowed to happen. And then how the U.S. turned around, took and borrowed money to pay, you know, on who they have to pay. You've got to pay, uh, you know, all these um, big investment companies back the money uh, and help them stay afloat, right? Because if a lot of these uh, companies had um, gone under, well, if a company that 
has, let's say, a trillion dollars investment goes under. Well, do you think in reality you have to pay this money back, David? Yeah. No. If the company doesn't exist, why would you have to pay the money back? Because the company doesn't exist anymore, so then you don't, you're not responsible for that money anymore. That's how that works. Yeah. Wow. Well, why would I? If that's my thinking, right? If, if for example, uh, if you owe Walmart, if you have money on a credit card and you owe Walmart thousand dollars, and Walmart closes down, they shut all their doors. Uh, why would you still have to continue paying that credit card? Right. That's a There's, fair point. That business is out of out of business. They may send your thousand uh, dollar bill to a collection agency and, and ask maybe try to collect it that way so they can recoup their money on their back end mm. but you're not required to play, pay the collection agency either you never signed a contract to pay them you signed a contract with walmart so in my thinking is why would you have to you know if the u.s government allowed these companies these financial institutions to completely crash there'd be thousands if not millions upon millions of people in the united states and in canada that would not have to pay back their mortgage loans while they Mm. can't have that because you know when you have over 10 20 30 million mortgages out there uh you know that's if you times that by the average two hundred thousand dollar home there's trillions of dollars that would never have to be paid back that's trillions of dollars for free people would have gotten isn't that exactly what happened though because people were bankrupt and had to declare bankruptcy and had no way of paying them back anyway well, I think a lot of people were declaring bankruptcy too because, uh, you know, when that started happening too, a lot of people started losing their jobs because, you know, the, the companies weren't making as much money. A lot of companies started doing, uh, what's the word, um, uh, when they start restructuring, right? So a lot of that started happening. So a lot of people started losing jobs that way. I think more now, so with the oil uh, problems we've had, uh, I don't even know, since 2011, 2012, or however long oil's been kind of, I guess oil's been about three, four years now. So I guess uh, 2014 or so, right? So uh, oil's been down. So a lot more people lost their jobs i'd say in the oil for sure because definitely oil runs the world right and and if oil runs the world you can definitely bet that the big banks have their money in oil as well Mm. and just for those who are interested in the big short another great documentary that details more or less the same happenings is called the inside job and matt damon is the narrator on it Right. Yeah, no, these are great movies too, right? I mean, this one's a little bit older. I believe this one was uh, 2010. 2010. Yeah, so I mean, this is a great movie too. And I definitely recommend looking into it and reading some of these articles and going on the Event Chronicle and just taking a look at this article. It is a little bit lengthy, but you know, if you have a good half hour, sit down and get yourself educated on the stuff that, you know, that the banking system does, you know, look at the stuff that people have done to try to help, you know, we people in society and help humanity. And every time someone tries to help, well, look what happens to them, right? They pass away. We've all heard about Kennedy being assassinated we got to watch that live on TV if I remember Mm. you know I wasn't born at that time neither were you David but I believe that they that was aired on television and since then no one has ever questioned the federal uh, banking system in the United States because there's obviously you know something that's going to happen to somebody if they try to change that right if what if we did stop borrowing the money from the fed system and uh, we started borrowing money from you know our own country versus somebody else what would happen then is that to suggest like government has interest in keeping people dumb or not aware of the facts i think the government definitely has an interest in keeping people broke ah Right. Because if you keep people broke, you control them. Right. Um, You control the fact that they have to work nine to five or longer, maybe, you know, instead of eight hours a day, 12 hours a day, 16 hours a day, because they got to pay back these loans on money that they borrowed. Right. Because, you know, we were told borrowing, going to the bank is a great thing and borrowing money from a bank is a great thing. But any, you know, true person who understands money understands that borrowing money from the bank is probably not the best uh, practice. Right. Uh, There can be reasons you borrow money. Absolutely. Definitely taxes tax advantages that are written into the government's um, you know books are are there for a reason but again keep in mind tax advantages are written by the government so there's got to be a reason that they've written these uh, tax advantages into their into their um, constitution so you can take advantage of it in the short term or long term they're still going to get your money somehow and unless you're in a situation like we were in 2008 getting a loan is actually really tough a bank is not terribly interested in giving you a loan i've found out they want you to make sure that you have a full-time job they want to make sure that you have some assets they want to know what your net worth is and going through this entire process that you may come to the conclusion that or they'll come to the conclusion that you're not approved for our loan we can't give you one and i know that i've had other family members and other people do go through the same process and i said no the bank's not terribly interested in just handing out money that they're not certain they can recoup 
That's right. And you made a great point because they want to ensure that they can get their money back on a monthly basis, right? That's how, just like, that's how like any, uh, you know, uh, business operates, right? That's how uh, telephone companies operate, for example, right? You sign a two-year contract with a telephone company. They're now guaranteeing for the next 24 months that they'll be sending you out a bill. Same as TV companies, right? You send, you sign a contract, even if it's month to month, every month to month, they're guaranteeing themselves that they're going to get your twenty hundred eighty dollars whatever it is you know um if you have um I can't even think of other examples right now. There are so many examples of where we have outgoing monthly recurring uh, income, right? So Tons. mortgage being one of them, right? Credit card debt being another one. Your utilities being another one, right? A car loan if you have one. A car loan being another one, absolutely, right? So if these companies can guarantee you that you'll keep paying them month after month after month, you know, they charge you the interest on it, so they make money on top of the money you owe them. On top of that, sometimes they can also compound it like a mortgage, right? Um, so that's, that's you just got to kind of watch where your money's going is the real real thing as well and also think about what you're getting in return i mean certainly if you're paying a mortgage you're getting a place to live but you're not really getting much beyond that in my opinion i mean certainly wait 10 years 20 years sell your house for more great but then you're just going to be spending more on your next home that you're going to buy so you're not getting a whole lot what about a car loan yes you get a car that you drive in the interim but you don't own it and you have to keep making payments on it so th- that too can begin to look like a bit of a pyramid scheme in the sense that th- there's a financial transaction that's ongoing for the ownership of what, but you don't really own it, do you? And the banks own it. No, and it's so true, right? I mean, a car is a depreciating liability, right? I don't yeah, call it an asset it's because not. although a lot of people count it in your asset column because it has value if you were to sell it, but it's a depreciating liability because if you owe money on it, each year you owe money on it, that value of that vehicle does drop. Right. I know typically they say um, when I worked at the car dealership, the, at the moment that the person buying the car drove the vehicle off the car lot and I was to buy it back, I could not buy it back for the exact same amount of money that they had uh, paid for it. Because as soon as that car is registered, they are now the first owner. Now the dealership becomes the second owner. Right. So we're we're going to give you 20 percent less. Typically, we've all heard of that. Drive the car off the lot. It's worth 20 percent less. Right. So how can you now be paying 100 percent? on a vehicle that's only worth 20% of what you bought it for, you know, and then you take that over, let's say a five year period, which most people take to pay off their vehicle, you know, your car is actually worth a lot less by the time you've paid off your 30, 40, 50, hundred thousand dollars, whatever your vehicle's worth, right? Now, if you were to also look at a lot of times what people do is they'll come in, they want to trade their car. And they'll want to, they'll say, you know, I want to buy this brand new car and they'll, they may still owe money on their old car. Cause that happens where a lot of people, you know, most people get sick of their vehicle probably in about a three year period, right? They want something new. There's so, yeah. there's a lot of new gadgets out there, a new car, new concept, you know, new bells and whistles, whatever that reason may be, right? Uh, start a family, have kids, whatever, right? Um, you get a new vehicle and you may still have 10, 15, $20,000 owing on your old vehicle, but Hey, no problem. The, the, the car companies and the banks will sometimes allow you, depending on, again, if you can carry this kind of debt load, take the old $10,000 you owed on a car you don't have anymore and add it into the value of the new car you just bought. So let's say you bought a $50,000 car. You now have a $60,000 loan for a $50,000 car. Hmm. And as soon as you drive that off the lot, it's still worth 20% less. So now you owe more money on a vehicle that's worth way less. So that's another way of getting you, you know, put into a system that really doesn't make sense. Exactly. I had a 2001 RAV4, which, you know, a Toyota car does tend to retain its value pretty well. But when I say retain, retain, it's still depreciating by quite a bit. So I must have bought it for over $30,000 when I first bought that Toyota RAV4. And then eventually it was written off because it was in an accident. So not in a major accident, but it was still enough of damage to the body work where things might have been kind of bent and uh, unre- uh, irreparable, basically. So when the insurance company wrote it off, they still valued it at $5,000. But again, wow. I said, you know, that's quite a bit. But again, I, I paid over $30,000. $30, and then, you know, if you calculate interest and fees on top of that, it's quite a bit of money lost. 
Right. Well, according to that, you lost just about twenty five thousand dollars at right? least. Yeah. Right. So, and then you got to look at, um, you know, if you owned your own business, yes, you did have an opportunity to potentially have some uh, vehicle write offs at that time. But you know, most people don't have their own businesses. Most people don't even know that they can write off their vehicle. Uh, you know, if they were just to start some sort of home based business, right? So, uh, I mean, if you're listening to this, definitely find ways to have a home based business and and get those advantages that a lot of people do not take you know take advantage of. Um, um, so that's one thing. That's why we're doing this as well, right? We started our own podcast. We have our own businesses on the side because we do want to take as many uh, advantages as we can to the system that's in place, right? I know you can't beat the system that's in place right now. Uh, the only way to beat it really is is to get the whole world to stand up against, the, you know, the big three families out there mm. that are really running the monetary system is and, and tell them we don't need them, right? And um, But until all the world can really get on the same page with that, uh, you know, we're going to continue to have what's happening in the world right now, which is wars. Not that we're accountants or anything, but what sort of write-offs can business owners typically expect to be able to take advantage of? You know, just to kind of give a, an idea, when uh, myself and yourself were in mm-hmm. uh, network marketing, at least a home, small home-based business, uh, you can look at potentially cars, uh, you a portion of your home because you're using that as a home office, uh, maybe some clothes that you buy, uh, 50% of meals, I believe, you were able to write off because you have to eat anyways. Um, you know, you're looking at uh, gas consumption, um, uh, depreciation of your vehicle. Um, I mean, there's so many different things. Entry fees, learning materials. Yes, that's correct. Books and entry fees into seminars or live events. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, tons of stuff. Even flying out to, uh, you know, if you were going to an event in Vegas, as an example, uh, you could definitely fly out there and, and write off a portion of your ticket, a portion of the, the hotel uh, that you're staying at, you know, uh, some of the entertainment, right? Maybe uh, a lot of times, you know, even if you're in your own city, if you go and meet a client, uh, a lot of business owners know this. A lot of oil companies know this, right? You throw a, 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 a you know a party for a thousand people, that can be written off as a business uh, expense, right? Because, uh, you know, big, com- big companies don't want to pay taxes. So, they'll actually spend money uh, on Christmas parties less nowadays because a lot of companies just kind of kind of conserve their money and what they have, right? They don't want to uh, put money out into the market because they're not potentially supposedly making as much as they used to, right? Because of low oil prices. But if they wanted to, they can definitely take advantage of those, um, you know, tax write-offs. I've even heard some wealthy business owners say that if you want to write, write off something in a particular area, then start a business in that field. Like for example, if you like surfing, and you want to write off your surfboard, start a surfing board business. And now you can write off your surfing and all expenses related to travel and to, you know, tickets and everything that you, you spend on to go and surf in the ocean or wherever it is that you're, you're surfing. I mean, you know, you'd have to talk to your accountant or talk to somebody that knows about this stuff, not us. But it, it sounds pretty interesting to me. You could just set up a business and have additional write-offs. Well, I think that's a great idea as well, right? I mean, that's a great uh, great thing for most people. But, you know, looking at the big picture of how, you know, even if you were to have a little bit of a write-off, you know, most people, again, you can only write off a portion of what your income is, right? So you're not going to be, if you only make $30,000 a year, you're not going to get more than what you paid in taxes back, right? You can't get, you know, $40,000 back from the government if you only made 30000 a year, right? So again, you have to be kind of smart with what you're making as well. But great advice on that, right? I mean, it's a great way to, you know, it's a good way to make your hobbies your business, right? And then write off your hobbies and still continue to enjoy what you enjoy doing. Um, You know, one of the things I do want to get into was looking at how wars, because it's kind of the idea of this Mm. article was how wars are actually funded by the banks, right? I'd read a bit about that, yeah. Yeah, and I think going back into history a little bit is something that uh, we should start a little bit and just kind of work our way to kind of what's happening nowadays, right, in the modern day. So uh, do you know a little bit about uh, World War I, World War II, uh, David? We certainly did learn it in school. I mean, I would have been in Japan when I learned about those things. But yeah, I'm only only what I remember. Right. I mean, and you got a way different perspective as well, right? I mean, I I learned about World War One, World War Two from the North American perspective, right? And you learned that same thing from the Japanese perspective. So very cool because you know the, both uh, both North American countries, Canada, U.S. Uh, were in the war as well as Japan was in the war as well, right? So I mean, what they were telling their uh, people and and what they're teaching in the schools are probably going to be a little bit different, right? But if we start looking at why the wars were happening, uh, you know, is it because uh, one person went crazy and was really trying to just control the whole world? Or was there some other agenda behind it? 
So the general impression that you get is like these countries were opposing each other or not in agreement over certain issues. And that's why they decided that they needed to settle their disputes in a more aggressive, violent manner. But if I had to guess, Mav, I think it's the, the latter. The, there was somebody with some agenda or maybe multiple people with a huge agenda behind why they wanted to go to war in the first place. Well, I do like your first actual reason as well. You know, maybe they did have some sort of dispute. And let's say that is the reason. Now, if you're going to go to war, what is the, the type of um, ammunition type stuff that you need to have so you can uh, go into a country and take over, right? You need to have some sort of uh, armor or, or uh, tanks or mm-hmm. guns, yeah. uh, something where you can go in with a lot of people and then they can have it. Well, guess where a lot of these uh, armor and, and ammunitions are being funded from for both sides, where do they for that? Is it the government? Well, not always the government. Yeah, you could say the government for sure, but the government has to borrow the money. So guess where they borrow the money? From the same families that own all the money. From the banks. From the banks. So if the, the, the Rothschild family, they don't really care who wins the war because they're not in the business of war. They're in the business of funding the war. So if you and me, for example, we're two different countries and we want to fight each other, David, but that one bank will fund you and they will fund me because they don't really care if you win or I win. All they want to do is, hey, if you are going to borrow $10 billion and I'm going to borrow $10 billion and we're going to build all the armor and ammunition and get our people trained up and ready to go to war and fight each other, all they care about is, hey, are you going to pay their $10 billion back or $10 million back or am I going to do the same thing? And they just want to make sure you pay the interest on that loan as well. And if you want to borrow more money because, you know, you're in trench warfare and this war has been going on three, four, five years now and, you know, you're, you, you've, you're fighting for inches, not even, you know, this is what happened during the war, right? They, they were fighting for inches and they would fight for inches for days and days and so many people would die. And all they care about was, hey, you want to borrow more money? No problem. We'll inject you with more money. Here's another interest rate. We're going to renegotiate our terms and now you can pay us more money, right? And they can do that to my side or your side of, of the war as well, right? So both sides were being... Uh, you know, treated the same way equally in this case, in my thinking, uh, by the same system that says, hey, we don't really care who wins as long as you continue to fight Fight as long as you need to. We, we, we're not going to stand in your way. We're not here to stop you from fighting. We're just here to help you keep going. And I'm sure the banking system isn't really worried about risk assessment. They're looking at the country going, well, they have enough assets to pay this off if they really need to. So no problem. We'll just lend it all we'll lend it all out. Also, the advantage of b- being a business, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Basically, what you're saying is, you know, the bank is sort of behind or it, it's the enabler of war. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they have they have a a reason for it, right? If if you if you think like a legitimate business, right? Your your goal as a business is to increase funds, right? Increase the amount of money that you hold. Uh, that's what the you know, and maybe assets or profits or market share or whatever, right? That's what your goal is. But that's what the bank the goal of these 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 families are as well, right? They want to increase profits and shares and for whatever reason, right? And and not just I don't think it's just monetary only, right? I don't I think when you start having over 500 uh, billion dollars you're not concerned about money anymore I, I don't think that is your main objective I think something else is behind that objective as well and you know what are wars actually fought for typically you know we're told war is fought for control or it's a terrorism thing it's a ban against Muslims it's um, you know we, we need to stop one person from uh, doing crazy things that we democratic people don't see um, as a way to progress in society, right? That's kind of what we're fed on watching CNN and watching a lot of these NBC and Fox News and ABC and all these news as we watch. That's what we're kind of told, right? But if you start listening to some of the alternative news out there and seeing what's actually going on, start reading articles, start listening to podcasts that are talking to you about real things, real life, and start connecting the dots of what's really going on, you'll really see what the reason for these wars are. In the last 10 or 20 years or so, you know, we do hear reports about these wars that that the U.S. is waging on on terrorism, which is the front that's given. That's the surface level answer that we're given as to why these wars are taking place. But in Canada, we hear things like, "Well, it's just for oil, or yeah, it's absolutely. just to just to control additional resources that the country needs right now." 
Yeah, and, and that's one reason to have a war, right? Because, you know, you don't have to necessarily control a country for oil. You can control a country for resources. Very well said, right? I mean, if you look at uh, the way, you know, when we had the imperial uh, imperialism back in the day when, you know, a lot of Europe was doing it, now all it is is the American people who are being imperialistic. They're going into countries. They're not, they don't really care to take over your country. I don't think they even want to live in that country or, or own that country in a way of, where the government has its presence, all they really want to know is the best way to control somebody is financially control somebody. And that's kind of what we started to show at the starting of our show is if you want to control people, get them into a debt situation where they can't pay you back. Well, if war is going to not only put the country that's going to war into debt, but put the country that's being, uh, the war is being held against into debt because now they got to borrow money to fix their country. You know, maybe the country that goes in um, says, you know, we're going to build rebuild the schools because that's what America did when they went into Iraq they said hey we're going to bomb your country and now we're going to bring our people so you can pay us to rebuild your infrastructure rebuild your schools and and that's where you know a lot of the country uh, companies such as Halliburton and stuff for example made so much money you know how how is it uh, Dick Cheney and uh, Warren Buffett made so much money off a of war how is that even possible yeah. they had nothing to do with it or did they that is the question isn't it Right. What do you think? Uh, well, I think uh, if you study on it, we'll, we'll find out, right? So right. I, I don't want to give my opinion on everything. I really want to have people go out and research and start understanding, you know, the countries and uh, the companies that we support and the, the companies that we see are huge companies on the, you know, the Dow Jones and the NASDAQ and all the companies that we're told are great, that are doing wonderful. And, you know, all the people that we're saying, you know, support them. Yeah, you know, they probably do give lots and lots of money away because I know Warren Buffett does give billions of dollars away. Yeah. But really, what is that billions of dollars going to in the big picture, right? When in, in actuality, sure, you, let's say you're helping uh, a million people, but then you're killing two million people because of the businesses that you run. Really, which one's more ethical? I'd say, you know, don't donate your money and let the two million people live, right? Yeah, that's great. No, I agree. I think people should go and explore things for themselves and find out for themselves and draw their own conclusions as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and one of the things I did want to also bring up is a uh, you know something different, right? I know a lot of us have heard of Saddam Hussein, and a lot of us had heard of uh, Gaddafi as well, right? Um, now with those guys, um, you know, in Iraq, let's start there with Saddam Hussein. Uh, before the U.S. went into Iraq and declared war on him, they needed a reason. Right. You can't just walk into a country and fight for no reason. So the reason we were told was that there's weapons of mass destruction. I remember that. And we heard that on the news day in and day out and day in and day out. And what did they find? Nothing. Nothing. They did not find any sort of weapons of mass destruction. The only thing they found was Saddam Hussein. And they found his millions and probably billions of dollars in U.S. cash. Well, guess what happened to that cash? What? I don't know. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> Me neither. And a lot of people don't know because if the U.S. Army went in and the U.S. government went in, well, to me, I'd have to think the U.S. probably took it. Um, you know, and the, the sanctions that the, the uh, Iraq government had on them was, you know what, you can sell your oil only for food. We're not going to let you. Well, guess what? If their oil is only being sold for food, that means their the market is not able to get that oil, right? Only the Iraqi government and the people are able to profit or benefit from it because that's, their oil is only going for certain things. Now, guess what? So now they have a reason. So now you go in, in you go in with planes and you bomb two, or you go in with planes and you crash them into two towers and into a Pentagon, which I never really seen the footage on that one. Hmm. And... Then you say, let's attack Iraq, a country that had nothing to do with the bombings. Well, what about the countries like Yemen and Saudi Arabia, where the supposed terrorists actually came from? How come you never went into those countries? Oh, those are oil countries that are already on the market. But Iraq wasn't. So when you go into a country like Iraq, now you can start you know, fighting there, bombing them, take out the government that's already in place, and now put the oil into the market. And that was in like 2001, was it? Uh, I think right after 9-11. So yeah, probably 2001 to 04 or so. Right. And the funniest part about that is like 
it's 16 years later and we still seem to be talking about September 11 all the time. And then there's the TSA and then this war on terrorism. None of it really seems to add up. It just seems like it's a whole lot of hot air about who knows what. I mean, it, it is probably money and control. Well, it's interesting. You said war on terrorism, right? If you look at, um, you know, there was Al Qaeda before, right? And then there was um, after Al Qaeda. Now there's ISIS. And now after ISIS, something else is going to come. And every time there's a new terrorist group, it's usually linked to a new U.S. president. Every time, if yeah. you look, if you actually do the math and count it to that, every eight years or so, there's always a new terrorist group that just comes out of nowhere, right? You know, we're to, we have to believe, based on what we've been told by the U.S. government, that they killed uh, Osama bin Laden. But guess who was funding Osama bin Laden for the longest time? The same country, the United States, for a long time was funding him because at one point they had nothing to lose. And if you look at it, the U.S. government has the largest um, benefits with the Saudi family of the bin Laden family too, right? So when you start watching these videos and documentaries, you start seeing like, wait a minute, why would a country like the United States have ties to the bin Laden family and then want to kill their son? Why? Someone answer that. And that makes me think of, you know, SARS, West Nile, mad cow disease, or Mitch Joel declaring the blo- end of blogging every few years. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mitch, I love you. But but yes, I, I, I don't have a hard time believing that, that to be the case. It's probably not that there's a new terrorist faction every four years or eight years or however long the the president stays in stays in power it's just more so that it makes more sense or it creates more drama or it it helps people draw people in to news and you know additional funds for you know the media and government and all that kind of stuff well for sure right and everybody's attention span is only going to last so long right so there's only so long you want to hear about isis before you stop caring there's only so long you want to hear about al-qaeda before you stop listening and caring so every four, eight years, if you can think of a new faction that's taking over the, you know, that's trying to cross problems in the world, you know, you start talking about them for another four to eight years, people will listen because now it's something new. It's fresh. It's it's another way to keep people interested uh, from being disinterested in their own lives. That's right. I guess we, we need like some things to keep us interested or so we're, 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 you know, we're shaped or we're taught to believe that, you know, we're not, our lives aren't that interesting. So we need to pay attention to something outside us. Absolutely. Right. And the last um, thing I wanted to bring up was, you know, um, Libya and Muammar Gaddafi. I'm not sure if you've heard of him. No, no. So he was the uh, prime minister or, or um, government in Libya at the, at the time, right? So I remember a few years ago, um, and this, this is probably about five years ago, there was a lot of talk when the UN and all these countries were talking and, and Gaddafi would go up there and talk. And on CNN, you would hear, oh, you know, Gaddafi did another two hour speech and he was talking about absolutely nothing. He was, you know, he's crazy. He's senile. It was just painting this picture of a guy who was nuts. And he was, tr- you know, trying to, 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 you know, he wasn't making any sense and, and uh, the governments really didn't know how to deal with him anymore. But the true fact was what he was trying to do was create his own state-owned banking system. So the banking system in his country would not be run by the Rothschild family or the Rockefeller family or the Morgan family. It would be run by the government. The, the government would do the, the banking system would be for the people. There is no interest-free loan. There was interest-free loans. There's The government would actually give the people homes and to uh, and uh, uh, jobs and, and create infrastructure where people could live and, and be in. And guess what? Well, he wanted to base this on his own dollar, his own currency, a currency his government and the people would own, which was called the gold, gold uh, denier. And I hope I say that correctly, right? Mm. Um, as soon as he announced that, well, guess what happened? What? Uh, the U.S. went in and killed Gaddafi, ah. right? So, and there's all these wars now that are in the Middle East and in, in, in Libya and in Syria because of this exact reason. So as soon as he tried to get outside of the banking system that exists, um, he was then seen as a threat to the world because of oil and, and his rhetoric and his craziness. But if you actually listen to what he said, well, most people didn't because we just believed what they told us on CNN. Who is going to listen to a two-hour speech by an interpreter of a, a language we don't understand? Most people are not. Only maybe 1% of a, of a, of a thousand or a hundred thousand people will actually spend the time to listen to that 
speech, but most people just believe because they don't want to listen to a two hour speech. They just want the summary version. They just want the summary. And the summary is anything I tell you if I know you're not going to listen to it. Yes, absolutely. It is. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's making a fact out of something that's really not a fact. Hmm. Right. So when they go in and then they they declare war against him. Right. And a lot of this was you can see. I mean, there are some clips of Hillary Clinton as well saying and I put saying in quotations, uh, I guess more. Uh, what's the best way to say it? She's kind of hinting at she okayed for the U.S. to go in. So, you know, she was mm. going to be our next, you know, in the U.S. anyways, the next government in the U.S. So whatever Donald Trump is doing, people see as a bad thing. But if she had gone in, how much worse is it really? I think it's going to be just as bad. She may have not put a Muslim ban against people, but she would declare wars against different places and different factuations because against her Clinton Foundation also has huge, um, you know, ties to a lot of different oil countries and a, little, a lot of banks and stuff like that too, right? One of the things uh, I don't know if people fail to see the the uh, the way things are happening in the United States, for example. Why did we have two Bush presidents? Why the father, then why the son? How yeah. is it that we we had both of them? You know, why is it always that kind of system? You know, why the Clinton, Bill Clinton, and then why then Hillary Clinton? Why is it that we almost had sixteen? We've had sixteen years of Bush, and when we almost had sixteen years of Clinton family. Yes. So why is it that we continually keep voting for the same people? I think that's why. Uh, Donald Trump got voted in. But again, now with all the stuff that he's doing too, again, he's, I think, just pushing along the agenda of of business people like himself, and he's pushing the agenda of the big banks as well, right? Yeah, he would be. And even in Canada, we have something similar happening. Like we used to have Pierre Trudeau, and now we have Justin Trudeau. That's correct, yeah. Right, and and just because of the name, uh, perhaps, and maybe some other factors, such as his good looks, which seem to be keep mentioned, and would like we have, like I don't know if people understand, but we basically have sort of a clown for a for a president, or not a president, but a prime minister, because he's going around taking selfies with of himself everywhere and everything, which you know. You know, it's a it's a cultural thing. I get it, and some people can have fun with it. But it, yeah, you're right. We we do keep voting for the same families. Well, it's so funny that you you brought up Justin Trudeau, right? And and the things that he's saying, the things that he's doing, right? Um, couple, in January, at the beginning of January, he said, you know, we're going to start putting a, you know, we want to start bringing down and closing the production of the oil sands in Alberta. You know, we need to start looking at alternative energy, and you know, and that was a little bit of an uproar in wet in Alberta because people are like, you know, we need the oil. Sands we need to continue to make jobs and stuff and again keep in mind oil does cause wars as well it's definitely one of the reasons for wars so did he have a good point on wanting to stop oil I don't know uh, and look for alternative energies maybe he does have a good point maybe he doesn't I mean if you talk to people in Alberta they will never go with that they'll always stick to oil as oil is uh, gold right uh, they'll never look at any other alternative but maybe he does have a good point but here was the funny thing as soon as Donald Trump you know, signed off an executive order on the Keystone Pipeline. He changed his tune. He said, "You know what? We're gonna we're gonna help out the people. We're gonna inject money into oil <laughs> because now he believed that this is what the people want to hear. So we're to believe that you know." He changed his mind, uh, and we're to believe that it's okay, even though he doesn't mean to. He didn't want to. He only changed it because after his talk with Donald Trump, then he changed his mind. Mm. And maybe he is seeing things that he didn't see before. That's obviously possible that all of us could change our opinion. But it is funny and that that turnaround, the way in which it happened. Well, yeah, you know, you you go have a meeting with Donald Trump. A couple days later, he says, yeah, sure, let's put out Keystone. And now you've changed your mind completely. So (laughs) it makes me wonder what else was actually discussed in their private meeting or in their private phone calls, right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know that that they are signing on and a lot of stuff that we don't even know what the two governments are talking about. And this is a a close knitted country like Canada and US, which are, you know, Canada more, especially if you go all over the world, Canada is seen as a, as a a great country and the people are wonderful. And, you know, people will take in Canadians into their homes and and feed them for, you know, because they know that they're good Canadians and Canadians would do the same thing for these people if they were to come here. Now you start teaming up with a, a corrupt government. Eventually that corrupt, you become seen as a corrupt government as well. Well, and one thing we know for sure that part of this decision had to be financial. 
hundred percent to tie it right into the topic that we're yeah. discussing. I mean, oil is like you said, it's big money here in Alberta, but it's big money everywhere, really, when you think about it. And also, we talked about how U.S. was trying to control more resources and more oil. I can't tell you if that's true or not. That's just what I've heard. But nevertheless, it sounds like it's a high priority for a lot of countries and a lot of leaders. Yeah. Well, if you look at it, the two uh, countries' banking systems is owned by the same uh, father company or mother company, right? Mm. So the the Rothschild family owns both banking systems. So really, they have a vested interest. And no matter what happens, oil or no oil, they have a invested interest. Because even if we say, uh, let's say the K- Canada decides not to participate in oil in Alberta, and they shut down all the refineries, well, that just creates more debt for the people living in Alberta and people who do business with Alberta. Well, guess what happens? If you have more debt, the government must borrow more money. So either way, the banking families win because they know that either money has to be borrowed to build pipelines or money has to be borrowed because people are in debt. So either way, the people who control the money own whatever happens. And someone had to think up this entire banking system. And it occurs to me that they must have been pretty smart, maybe devious too, but definitely smart. Oh, absolutely, man. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> like, you know, uh, it's it's a it's a very interesting thing. And I think people need to really look at, you know, the banking system, really look and consider what your life looks like because of the banking system, right? Like really step away and look at, you know, if you're happy the way you are, you know, I'm very happy for you and I hope you continue to have a successful life. But consider all the millions and, and uh, billions of people on this planet who do not have a chance to be as happy as you are and look at all the, the things that they're going through because of that. Absolutely. Right. Did you have any other points that you wanted to share with us, Matt? You know what, man? I got. I don't have any more points. I mean, we could definitely talk about this forever yeah. because there's so much information on this. Uh, I will actually just uh, do a quick summary. Like I said, there was yeah. one comment that I did want to say at the end of this. What I wanted to say was, you know, I'm going to play devil's advocate to the banking system for a second myself. You know, and I'm going to say, yeah. you know what, if I was the Rothschild family and if I had the opportunity to uh, leave a legacy in this world, What would be the legacy I would want to leave for my family to be remembered by? And I mean, everybody has to think of what their legacy is and everybody has a different definition of what that legacy they want to leave behind. But the ultimate legacy would be to own all the money in the world, to control all the assets and oil and the people in this world and control everybody's lives and enslave the planet. If you could enslave every single person and have them indebted to you, would that not be the ultimate legacy? I'm not agreeing with it. I'm just saying, would that not be the ultimate legacy to have? Yeah. Well, I guess anybody that's born into that family will always have that, right? So Absolutely. Yeah. I think for me, it just reminds me of how important actually owning something is, like a business. And to think about the implications, right? What about debt? Well, it's not great for us to carry debt for many reasons we've already talked about. And that just enslaves us and keeps us in this cycle of paying a little bit of money and then getting collections to call and ask us when we're going to pay additional funds. So we set the schedule and we pay additional funds. But their goal, that's that's their goal. They want you to just keep a trickle of money coming in for their business because it's more profitable for them to keep that trickle coming versus you paying it all off at once and getting rid of that interest. So we need to think about not just on a small scale what that means, but on a bigger scale, what does that mean? What does that mean for countries or entire countries that that take out billions of dollars to pay for wars and things like that? Absolutely well said, David. Cool. Well, this has been a great conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. We have a few things that we would love for you to do. One is to leave a comment on our website at usingyourpower.com, or you can also go to YouTube and find our videos or in or our podcast in video forms there and leave a comment there. You can go to our website and download our free course, 10 Simple Ways to Unlock or Unleash. Unleash. Unleash your personal power. I'll get same that Same thing. Right. Unleash and unlock. Kind of the same idea. Yeah, yeah, basically the same idea. If you just click on any podcast episode, scroll to the bottom, not right to the bottom, just above the comments, you'll find the banner and you can just click on it and enter your email address to, to grab that. And we are also on Facebook Messenger. Why not, right? So uh, we know how popular Messenger apps are. You can definitely feel free to leave us a message using the messenger app right up on our website there's a button in the right bottom right hand corner and sometimes it'll just automatically ask you questions as well 
Absolutely. You know what? Go on to that messenger. Let us know what you thought about this episode. If you think this episode is a bunch of garbage and a bunch of BS, please let us know. Yep. And if you do believe that, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today is an actuality, a reality that you see as well, let us know. Absolutely. We'll have to hear it. So this has been Using Your Power. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.